Kaha was not very fond of ex economists. There were just very few persons whom he appreciated as, as professionals, as economists, and so on. One of them is uh, Professor Stanchev, Krasen Stanchev, who is here, and um, we are really grateful to him that he made this one day trip to really contribute to the memorial days of uh, Kaha. And it's not just relations that we are like uh, scientific. So they, I think uh, maybe, and Krasen will mention, they had a lot of discussions, maybe sometimes, I don't know, different views and so on. But um, this is one of the few persons uh, whom he, in the economic scientific field, he really appreciated and uh, uh, valued, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, we are from the same past, as you have probably read and or know. Uh, Krasen is from Bulgaria, so who underwent this dramatic changes after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And he was at the, let's say, roots, roots of, of uh, establishing the new Bulgarian Republic in the institutional sense and possibly in the economic sense. And the third interesting topic is that uh, Kaha spent his um, last months uh, really frequently visiting Ukraine and also predicting in 
there was a lecture. He was sitting right here, giving the lectures to the students in 2014, and actually exactly pro pro predicted. predicted so what would happen as we see it now. So this is there is a footage of that. So it's not just uh, something you have to trust me. You can. Just go to these records and see how he is really predicting what is uh, happening there. And um, Krasen is, if I say, frequent visitor to Ukraine. Will I be wrong? Yes. Yeah. So, and he knows uh, the situation there from the first hand. And uh, our kind request was to him to give a lecture on this theme to give us a uh, view in the broader context of what's economically happening in Ukraine, what could, could be the spill out effect of these events to the neighborhood, possibly globally. Maybe, I don't know, interesting will be to hear, so what is the Krasen's view of, on the future of Russia or Russian Federation and um, possibly place some, I don't know, Kaha's uh, uh, view on that if those are known to you. Yeah? And this is, I think, a very interesting uh, lecture to us. But before we go there, uh, our university has a tradition to award the persons, academicians, who tangibly or intangibly support our uh, university with the title of distinguished professor. There are a couple of Nobel Prize winners who have this title, and we are proud and honored to offer this title to Professor Stanchev. So, by the way, here is David. You helped us to publish his article so in your uh, university uh, journal. So on the uh, uh, topic of uh, controlling the arms, which was, I think, very interesting research. And uh, now he's a PhD, by the way. So, and those things, yeah, you, you directly or indirectly supported us. And it's not maybe, I don't know, proportionate reward, but it's something which we really value and uh, would like to present this title to you. So it takes a small ceremony. So we have, please take home. Or in your office. Or in your office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it actually looks a little bit like a bow. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, it's like a, a single lens. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, wow. the whole thing, you know. <laughs> so you are, yeah, you will be now a fully equipped distinguished professor. <laughs> so. Yo Marjaba. Dobrugo vechora, mi z Ukraini. All of us are Ukrainians now. So uh, on 15th of March 2014, I was part of the Stop Russia rally on the Rustavi uh, uh, street here. Sorry? Rustavelli. 
Yeah, Rustam Ali. Uh, it was three days before the annexation of Crimea. Uh, perhaps it was too late to go on street and shout that Russia must be stopped. Uh, two days before the event here, uh, with Kaha, it was on 12th and 13th of March uh, 2014, with Kaha, Ilarionov uh, Andrei, uh, Enos Repas, uh, finance minister, ex-finance minister of Latvia, Ivan Miklos, uh, ex-prime minister of uh, Slovakia, uh, one of the best bankers, uh, central bankers uh, in the world, uh, he has an award for that, Warren Coates. Uh, we were in Kiev trying to prevent the worst of happening. We had lots of good ideas. So, for example, one of the good ideas, you know, to prevent the annexation of Crimea, uh, it was Ilarionov's idea, to organize a seminar for NATO generals uh, in Yalta, for example, or in Sevastopol next week. So, which basically would mean, you know, that the proper security measures are taken and the green uh, people would not come from Russia, you know, to, 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 to watch the referendum. This idea, it was simple. I'm not sure whether it was realistic or not. Uh, could have make a difference. And there were lots of such ideas who, which could have made a difference. So the problem was, it was a big audience, like 2,000 uh, Ukrainians in the room. It was immediately after the Maidan. Uh, actually, with uh, a Georgian friend, we visited the Maidan. It was Pata Shashilidze of the New School of Georgia, New Economic School of Georgia. Uh, the problem was that Ukrainians themselves, nobody from the audience even, nobody from the government, including the Minister of, uh, <coughs> of, of Economy, who then invited Kaha as, uh, as part of his uh, uh, Reform Council, already later that year, nobody understood the urgency of the matter. Nobody understood that they need to act immediately. So one of my ideas was that the president, Poroshenko, sends that very night a letter to Mr. Barroso, then president of the European Commission, asking for two things. Number one, free visa traveling of all Ukrainians to the European Union, and second, unilateral trade liberalization with Ukraine. Why unilateral European Union trade liberalization with Ukraine? Because of something very simple. This was tried by the European Union. After the war in the Balkans, the so-called ex-Yugoslav wars, the key problem was to restore the economy, and I will return about this uh, topic for Ukraine, to restore the economy, and how you restore the economy when you have everybody fighting with each other and everybody owns a gun, as David knows. Uh, so the only way is to make people cooperate. And how you make them cooperate? So if they trade with one another, they will be trading with poorer or as poorer people as they are. So, which doesn't make sense. I mean, it makes sense, you know, of with trading with somebody richer than yourselves. These two ideas, which, as I said, you know, meant that the president sends a letter on visa and the minister of economy sends a letter on unilateral trade liberalization. 
referring to the experience of the European Union with the Balkans. So what made the Balkans prosper was this exactly effort, which came late, like five years after the end of the Balkan Wars, but it was tremendously expensive, uh, tremendously uh, 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 wealthy experience, because for 10 years, the trade of the Western Balkans, which is ex-Yugoslavia plus Albania, increased with the European Union, increased seven times, and 70% of every new euro of income for those countries came from the European Union. Why? Because the Balkans managed to sell something which Europeans wanted to buy. And because the European market is more sophisticated and much wealthier, it was translated into a prosperity for the Balkans. So all this did not mean in that very moment, on 12th of March 2014, that it will happen overnight. What was needed then is that the international, the so-called international community, or the European Union, sends a message that we treat Ukrainians with the visa, we treat Ukrainians, Georgians, those who wish to become normal, differently from Russia. And the trade, it wouldn't happen overnight. So there is a complicated procedure of decision-making in the European Union. You need an unanimous decision of all the member states. The document is about 2,000 pages. So with the Balkans, it happened by 2014. It happened three times. So all the countries of the European Union were voting again and again, voting the zero tariff regime for every unit of import from the Western Balkans. So, but this, this would have been a message to all the Ukrainians and to all the Russians, by the way, that they would better, about the Russians, they would be better cooperating with Ukrainians in order to get better access to the European market. I believe it would have happened if there was a letter from Minister Shevchenko <coughs> to the European Commission, it would have happened probably two years after the letter. But nevertheless, it would have meant that there is a prospect. So, and there were lots of such ideas, simple, which needed to be done from one day to another. And the urgency of the matter was the key Kaha's point of that meeting. He started, we were asked to, to speak in Russian. Uh, and those who knew Russian, we spoke in Russian. So Kaha basically said, I will quote it in English, because in Russian it's much nastier. <laughs> so he said, the first thing Ukraine must understand is in how deep shit it is in. And then he delivered the macroeconomic analysis of the situation. And macroeconomic ana analysis of situation is to be found in, uh, on internet, and that sort of stuff. Kaka was, uh, was, uh, was speaking very often on that. It may be found uh, in uh, his interviews with Dmitry Gordon in Ukraine. It might be found in uh, uh, the book of... Uh, it's translated now, as far as I understand, in, uh, in Georgian. His book of interviews with uh, Fomin, uh, from, yeah, Fomin, yeah? Uh, uh, from Forbes uh, Russia, Forbes Ukraine. So all this thing, you know, in plain Russian language, so about the deep shit, you know, and the needs of understanding it, it didn't find an open ear in the audience. 
Nobody had the sense of emergency. A uh, couple of things about myself. Uh, I know Ukraine by chance uh, since uh, 2004. That's uh, President Yushchenko's campaign. Uh, a friend of mine, Yushchenko was then with the Central Bank, and I will come to the Central Bank in relation to the war. Uh, a friend of mine, an American, uh, sent me a letter and, 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 and asked, there is a good guy who is running for a president in Kiev. Would you be ready to contribute something for his campaign because he's a poor guy? Uh, so he's just, just a central banker, you know, doesn't have a business. I said, okay, who's the guy? He named the guy. Checked the internet, you know, understood that Yanukovych is not the right guy and that he's a friend of Putin. So, and my motivation was to, con to contribute $1,000 to the Yushchenko's campaign, was very simple. <coughs> he, Yushchenko, was not a Putinite. So, Yanukovych was a friend of Putin, which basically meant that if Yanukovych wins, sooner or later he will try to deal away with with normal political establishment efforts, which was Ukraine, which was Georgia, which was Moldova, which was Bulgaria, which was uh, Poland. So what Kremlin, Putin, and KGB did not like about all these countries is not the countries themselves, because they still visit all of our countries. So what they did not like they did not like the political landscape. They did not like the political system. That's why they started the war with, uh, with Georgia. So that was my first, whatever, political experience with uh, Ukraine. And my last uh, political experience with Ukraine is uh, two weeks uh, ago. Uh, I was part of a group to see how Ukraine needs to reform its public finances during the war and what would be the expected situation after the war. So, going back to, to 2014, second Kaha's point on 12th of March was also very simple and also misunderstood or missing understanding in those months. And his point was that what is going on now in Ukraine is not about Ukraine. It is about everybody else. This is about Georgia. This is about Moldova. This is about Poland. This is about Europe. And Europe not as the European Union. Europe as Europe. Europe as as, as, a, as a place which is relatively normal. You can travel from one place to another, you can enjoy different uh, opportunities in life, and you can enjoy, Kaha said, you can enjoy the evidence, the criteria of uh, economic development. And the criteria of economic development is the enlargement of choices, individuals, individual people, have at their disposal. Nothing more. This simple message that freedom matters for prosperity was one of the key Kaha's beliefs, and it was one of our, you know, the, the entire group believes over there. So, and this was again with a silent reaction from the audience. What happened after the annexation of Crimea is that Ukraine, all stratas of the society, from the so-called oligarchs, uh, actually Petro Poroshenko was believed to be uh, an oligarch, uh, to, to the last person, they understood that 
what they had in Ukraine, with all these whatever deficiencies, uh, allegations of corruption, uh, Gordon once asked uh, 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 Kaha, you know, I mean, Georgia used to be the, 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 the most corrupt countries from, from, from the Soviet Union camp. So now it is Ukraine. So with all these deficiencies, what would have mattered is first to defend your freedom, second to defend your system of freedom, because freedom is not just freedom. Freedom is responsibility. And if you take Ukrainian example and Russian example, so for the time Putin was in office, Ukraine changed five presidents, six parliaments. There is no, I mean, there were such cases in the beginning of, uh, of the 90s, you know, uh, crackdown on journalism, on free speech, and that sort of stuff. This was not already the, the case in 2014. What happened in 2014 is what was experienced before that. What happened to Ukraine in 2014 was an experience known by Georgia in 2008. So, you probably know more details than I know, but what happened in 2008 is that besides general declaration by the so-called international community, by NATO, by United States, North America, European Union, was the statement that, you know, what happened uh, in August 2008 is not acceptable. So, and that's it. I mean, Georgia is a nice but not very big country, so what the international community decided, you know, is that, that we feel with cash, Georgia, we will help them uh, joining the European Union, we will involve them in uh, uh, partnership for peace in NATO, and that sort of stuff. Nobody actually sanctioned Russia. So something of the sort happened in 2014, already in the case of Ukraine. If one looks today at documents, legal side of the sanctions imposition on Russia, all the documents international community refers to, be this the Congress of the United States or the President of the United States, the European Union or Canada or Japan, all this is related to the developments after Crimea. So, but the sanctions were weak. Why they were weak? Why they did not make a difference? Why they did not prevent Russia of invading Ukraine last year? The answer is very simple. Because they were not biting. So in order to punish someone or prevent someone of doing something, you know, the counterpoint should be very strong. If the counterpoint is weak, although legalistically acceptable, because all the documents, all the decisions, if you look at the, 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 the decisions made uh, uh, last and this year uh, in terms of sanctions, all decisions refer to one and the same document issued by uh, different international governments, including that of the European Union, issued in April 2014. So, why those sanctions did not bite? They did not bite for two reasons. One is uh, uh, addiction, and the second one is stupidity. I will start with the second one. So, 
in fact, the European Union failed before us coming to Kiev in uh, 2014. Why? Because watching what's going on in Ukraine with uh, uh, the double speak and double game of, uh, of the President Yanukovych, they decided to, to be nice to Ukraine. And what they offered, they offered half a billion free trade agreement with Ukraine, which is the stupidest idea ever coming you know, in place. Because of trade, say, then nine and a half billion euro, half a billion free trade agreement cannot even start. Or if it starts, it will create more harm than good because it will send the message to all Ukrainians who can buy, can, can, can find something which Europeans want to buy, and they line up on the customs with the European Union, and when the amount is exceeding 500 billion, for example, 500 billion euro and one euro above, so the, the free trade agreement stops. So that's the stupidity. So it was not the right thing to do in 2013. Uh, addiction. European Union believed already in 2012 that they can use cheap, energy resources from Russia and with cheap energy resources from Russia they will reduce the costs of doing business, the, the, the investment of doing business, uh, not the artificial, not the regulatory costs, but the, the, the actual costs of uh, real uh, costs of, uh, of doing business and keep social programs of the European Union because the energy cost is going down. Because of that, the European Union failed to recognize one of the key problems of Ukraine. And Ukraine, like many other countries, was addicted to Russian natural gas. There was a case, there was a warning in 2009 that addiction to, to, to Russian gas may create a problem. And when Gazprom stopped supplying uh, naphtha gas with, uh, uh, with uh, natural gas from Russia, you know, there was an energy crisis in Ukraine, energy crisis in Moldova, energy crisis in Bulgaria, on all the countries in the pipeline. So what the European Union did, you know, they created additional pipelines and through Slovakia they could have supplied the same Russian natural gas to Ukraine. And they believe that's, that's fine. So we keep using, you know, relatively cheap gas from, uh, uh, from Russia. In case there is a repetition of the disaster, energy disaster for Ukraine, uh, uh, like in 2009, we will supply, uh, uh, we will supply gas to, to Ukraine. So the, the, the issue was resolved from the standpoint of, uh, of the European Union. But this was not the case, because when you finance social welfare with the reduction, artificial perhaps reduction, or additional investment in, in, in natural gas supply from one source, you basically start depending on that source. And being dependent on that source, sooner or later, leads to addiction. And this addiction was absolutely visible in Ukraine, this addiction was absolutely visible in Moldova, and this addiction was absolutely visible in Belarus. The only country which managed to deal away with this addiction 
was Georgia. The Georgian example was not paid the necessary attention. So what happened to Georgia is that from 98% of Russian energy supplies to the Georgian economy, it was reduced in two years to 46%. C competition was created, so because of competition, there was no dependency. This is the second thing, you know, Russia didn't like about, about Georgia. If a country is not dependent on Russia, it becomes sooner or later an enemy. So this was not the case with Ukraine. So why? Because the price of natural gas, Ukrainian households were paying uh, to Naftogaz, to this supplier, was five times less the price Naftogaz was paying to Gazprom. So, obviously, you know, what could have done then is next to nothing. But the European Union could have done something. They could have go for debt for, 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 for equity swap. So, for example, the European Union was building the pipelines to supply, to, to, to create additional supplies to, uh, to, to, to Ukraine. So, the European Union could have applied for a stake in Naftogaz, which wouldn't mean exactly a privatization of, uh, of Naftogaz, but it would have mean that Russia or Gazprom faces not Naftogaz, a state-owned company or political, politically connected company of Ukraine, it would face <coughs> players of the gas market or the energy market of the European Union, most of whom are private, including some public uh, companies, of course. So, and then there would have been no opportunity for Gazprom or Kremlin to use energy supply as a bargaining tool of influence over the Ukrainian political establishment. This was not happening. The Georgian experience was not taken into account. What was the development later is that in 2014, with all these whatever soft sanctions, nobody paid attention to the addiction of Ukraine itself. Nobody paid attention to the addiction of the European Union to cheap energy supply from Russia. And because there was no such, a, uh, such attention, in the years of COVID-19 pandemic, when the economy basically stopped working, and it stopped working not because of the economic crisis, it stopped working because of political pressure, so because of lockdown. So when you have a lockdown, you basically exclude the human element from, from the economy. You exclude the fact that something should be produced, something should be taken to the market, and something should be offered to somebody who wants to buy it. When you close the economy, the physical movement of people, which is very well visible you know, from, uh, uh, from Google uh, mobility uh, uh, software, if you go, you will see, you know, for Georgia even, I was comparing Bulgaria and Georgia, you will see, you know, in 2020, how, for example, visiting shops, shops is reduced, you know, in one month, you know, by 40%. And for the next month, another 5%. And for the next month, another 5%. Eventually, by the end of the year, visiting shops, you know, was reduced by 50, 50 something percent. In Georgia, less than in Bulgaria, because Georgia is freer, you know, but... Uh, and when you, you stop the physical and human element in the economy, 
you basically have a downturn. So the economy stops functioning. Economy is not about the money. Economy is about people. Economy is about freedom of exchange. So and when you have a crackdown on freedom, then you basically crack down, have a crackdown on the economy. But because it was a political stoppage of economic activity, when the economy started growing up in the end of 2020, but especially in the second half of, uh, of uh, 2021, so the, the economy, of course, started working, and the energy prices had skyrocketed. So, for example, electricity jumped about, uh, about three times uh, in the European Union, gas supplies three and a half times, uh, petrol, crude oil, you know, about two and a half times. So all this basically gave the financial leverage of forging the war on Ukraine. Why? Because before that, there was addiction. So, the European Union, North America, the entire world, China. Uh, they are much stronger than, than Russia. This was one of the things, you know, uh, we were trying to explain uh, in, uh, in March 2014 to Ukrainians. And not only Kaha, but Andrei Larionov, myself, uh, uh, Ivan Miklos. Uh, what we had in 2000, I will come to, to this year. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that you may interrupt me at any point. <laughs> Uh, if something is not clear, if you want to know something, and that sort of stuff. So, we were trying to explain in 2014 that Russia in 2012 was an economy relatively large. It was uh, almost 50% of the economy of Germany in terms of GDP. Uh, in 2013, it was smaller. In 2014, the Russian economy was even smaller. So it went you know, to about 20% of the German economy. In 2014, it was uh, about 10% about of the economy of the European Union, uh, about the size of the economy of uh, Spain, and Netherlands was almost like Russia, but not with 150 million of population, but with 15 million of population. So, which basically meant that uh, Russia is weak. So, and what the government of Ukraine needs to do is just act on simple things. So, the message was not heard. So, what we have now? We have now the Russian economy, which is uh, already about 10%. You have uh, uh, a conflict, which basically everybody already understands in the terms we understood it, and Kaha understood it in in 2014, that this is not about Ukraine, this is about us, this is about Georgia, this is about Bulgaria, this is about European Union, this is about Europe, this is about Moldova, this is about Poland. And in this situation, you measure Russia, not to Ukraine, but you measure Russia in relation to those who are threatened. And if you measure Russia to those who are threatened, you realize one very simple thing in terms of military expenditure. Russia is 12 times smaller than NATO. In terms of military expenditures, Russia is 18 times smaller than China. Russia used to be, in 2014, the country of Europe with highest 
share of military expenditures to GDP, about 4%, almost matching United States. Then United States were uh, like 4.3% of GDP. All the European countries, or most of the NATO countries, had this less than 2%, which was required by, uh, by the treaty. Less than 2% military expenditures. What the war actually created is a totally new situation. If from the 60s, the last, whatever, global crisis, uh, the so-called uh, Cuban crisis or uh, Caribbean crisis, uh, a, a nuclear standoff uh, between the world and, uh, and the Soviet Union, uh, the military expenditures globally went down by a factor of three, three times less expenditures. In 1961, military expenditures globally were about 6.5% of GDP. So in 2021, sorry, in, to, in, in 2014, they were 2%. And they were kept at 2% everywhere, but not in, uh, in Ukraine. In 2014, beginning of the 2014, Ukrainian military expenditures were four times less than, uh, than the military expenditures of Russia. And that's why Russia you know, felt like uh, uh, free to invade not only Crimea, but the eastern provinces of, of Ukraine. By the way, Kaha Bendukidze has a very good comment on, uh, on that behavior. So what happened with Ukraine military expenditures is that after 2014, they increased three times, almost matching the expenditures of Russia. But because it was new investment, the Ukrainian army is much smarter than the Russian army. Another thing which is very important is the invasion of Crimea was an outrageous violation of international law because of one, two simple facts. Number one, this was the first invasion of a neighboring country territory in the entire history of the, after the World War II. There were conflicts. There were conflicts between Pakistan and India. There were conflicts between the two careers. There were other conflicts around the globe. But there was no country to invade a territory of a neighboring country. The only country which was doing that after the World War II was the Soviet Union and then Russia. If you take Russia, because the Soviet Union is illegitimate, I mean, if you believe, uh, in this uh, Soviet Union is already an illegitimate uh, uh, subject, uh, actor. So if you take Russia, you have the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, you have the three interventions in Georgia, you have Transnistria, and then you have Crimea, Eastern provinces, and the war of 2002. The second fact is that in 2014 is the first case after the creation of the United Nations when a founding state, initiator of the United Nations and the member of the Security Council is invading a territory of another country. And if you read the, the bylaws, the Constitution of the United Nations, the members of the Security Council are required by the international law that they keep the peace. And if there is something you know, which is happening like an uh, annexation of a territory, they are obliged to act against this. So, and here you have a country which is a founder and a member of the Security Council which is invading another country. This was in 2000. By the way, also founding. Founding, yeah, founding, founding. Yes, yes, I know, I know. Another founding member, that's, that's what, what was, what, another, another founding member is Ukraine. So you have, 
you have the entire international order not functioning. And there is a clear evidence for that. So being silent then, as an international community, whatever it means. So basically, contributed to the motivation of the KGB clique around Kremlin and Putin. Putin is not the only problem. The, the system is the problem. And that was another Kaha's point, by the way. Uh, so motivated, you know, the aggression of, uh, of, 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 of 2022. What was specific also mentioning Ukraine is that according to the Budapest Agreement of 94, which was following a decision of the Verkhovna Rada since the Soviet times, since April 1990, uh, there was a declaration by Verkhovna Rada in Kiev that Ukraine wants an independence and wants to pay the price of independence, which basically means two things. Number one is demilitarization of Ukraine, and that's why they reduced the military expenditures. And number two, getting rid of the nuclear arsenal. The nuclear arsenal uh, was transferred to Russia in, in the implementation process of the so-called Budapest Agreement of 1994, according to which Russia accepts the nuclear arsenal and is a guarantor of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. So now people compare that the, the, the 24th of February last year with 38 and 39 behavior of Germany. This is wrong. Because Germany, during the, uh, the so-called Munich Agreement of 38, Germany was given the right to take a territory, by an international agreement, to take a territory, territory of Czechoslovakia. By the way, if somebody wants to, 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 to learn something about Czechoslovakia in 38, just go on Google, National Geographic, Yankees of Europe, August 1938. You will see a great feature of the entire volume of National Geographic about what is Czechoslovakia then. So, but Germany had the right, so to say. You may disagree now with that, you know, you may, dif may have different comments, you know, Czechs and Slovaks, they have, of course, you know, their negative attitude towards that. But there was an international law which basically allowed Germany to, uh, to, to annex a territory of uh, Czechoslovakia, the so-called Sudetenland. So if you take the 1st of September, 1939, Germany was not a guarantor of the independence of Poland. So they had their reasons, which are very similar to, to, to the explanations given by, uh, uh, by, by Kremlin, you know, for the war of last year, but, you know, they were not a guarantor of the international law. Russia was a guarantor of international law in 39. Germany was not. Because Russia was applying, you know, to different uh, countries, you know, to, uh, to keep peace, you know, had a formal contract uh, with uh, Germany of uh, mutual cooperation and that sort of stuff. In fact, it was an act, you know, forging a war. So, and Russia was a co-aggressor against Poland. So there was no co-aggressor, no international community against Ukraine. Russia did it on its own. So, uh, so what, what's the stake, what's the challenge now? 
couple of impressions, you know, from my last visit. Actually, before the war, uh, before Christmas uh, uh, 2021, I was in uh, Kiev discussing basically the same issues. We were two foreigners, one Polish and I, uh, discussing with uh, members of the committee, heads of the committees uh, of Verkhovna Rada, President's Economic Advisor, discussing the, uh, the, the, the tax reform. And uh, the head of the Finance and Budget Committee of Verkhovna Rada took the floor and said, uh, okay, you know, the system is not good, uh, we shall simplify it, and what we shall do now is to abolish the military tax. So, for those who don't know, uh, Ukraine has a, a flat tax system of 80% of each hryvna uh, 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 of, uh, of income, uh, and then a military tax imposed in uh, 2014, effective of 2015, of 1.5%. And this 1.5% tax is the only tax Ukrainians pay. So, on everything else, you know, they, they try not to pay. So, and uh, uh, I took the floor and said, you know, Mr. Somebody, I mean, probably you touch something different, you know, from this tax, because people are first paying it, and second, you have, uh, uh, then in December, you have about 70,000 Russian troops on your borders. This is not the right moment. So the reaction of the audience, you know, these were industrial leaders, uh, all the business associations, three committees of, uh, of uh, heads of the committees of Verkhovna Rada. Everybody said, no, 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 you don't understand, you know. Russians, they simply play games, you know. They would never, because it doesn't make sense. They said it doesn't make sense for them. So, the, the, the system, tax system is such as, as it is, you know, perhaps we will keep this tax, but we shall continue something else. So, but this comment was made after my Polish colleague made this. I mean, he's a famous expert on, on tax systems from the World Bank. Uh, so, <laughs> Only when the Polish colleague intervened, you know, they realized that there might be, I mean, the entire audience of about 30 industrial leaders, they realized that there might be an issue. So, in December 21, they basically did not consider the danger real. And it was everybody. It was from the president's office, you know, to, 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 to ordinary Ukrainians. When I talked to them, on 21st and 22nd of December 2021, nobody believed it would happen. Why? Because everybody believed that KGB and Putin are very smart. So, they're not smart. The, the, the world was surprised by the stupidity of this act. It's, it's a plain stupidity. Nobody could have imagined that an abbreviation with such, whatever, horrific connotations like NKVD, KGB, and that sort of stuff, is so stupid. But they're stupid. So, uh, impressions. Now, everyone in Ukraine understands, you know, that issue at stake is not only them, this is also us. Everybody in the world understands that it's not Ukraine, this us. Everybody in Ukraine hates KGB, Kremlin, and very often Russia. <sighs> Another very important impression. Uh, after my talk, you know, in, you know two weeks ago, uh, it was an audience about a uh, thousand people, uh, and I went for a coffee break and the panel was changed, and different people approached me, uh, and suddenly comes a, a guy, younger than me, in a military uniform. I asked him what is his whatever rank. He said, I'm a colonel. And we started discussing economics. And the guy was like a professor in economics. I said, you know, who you are? Why, I mean, you're a simple 
a military guy or you are somebody else? He said, I'm a deputy governor of the Central Bank. And I asked, you know, what you do in, in the army? He said, I'm managing the logistics of the army and I'm managing the supplies of the army. And I said, you're the only one, you know, from the Central Bank who is in the army as a volunteer? No, he said, we are 100 former employees or current employees of the Central Bank who went to defend the country, which basically means that the unity and the resolve of the people is there. I visited the next day, I visited Irpin, which is one of the destroyed cities. I can tell you stories I have on my telephone, you know, lots of pictures, I explained this on the internet. It was an absolutely outrageous and senseless uh, uh, destruction. When the Russian army, the city was defended first by volunteers who didn't have arms even. They were armed by one of the local companies which, thanks to, to corruption, managed to buy arms you know, from the army and equip you know, the, the defenders of the city. So, but when the Russian army received reinforcement, and they crossed the river Ipin and they entered the city. They simply killed 100, 000, 100 uh, people who were in the, in the cars, you know, fleeing the, 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 the place. And these 100 were, of course, mothers with kids and all, all, all the senior citizens. So it's, and then you look, I told Gian today, my military uh, uh, specialty is how to blow things. So when I looked at, at, at the house of flats, you know, so you see that a tank or, or a cannon, it goes in front of the house and it destroys store by store in the middle of the house in order to have it collapsing like that. Why? Why? And what if there are people there? So it's so, so irrational. And in that city, it is now being, it was visited by President Biden, by the way, and uh, it received lots of uh, donations after the visit of President Biden. Uh, but now the city, which was destroyed 70%, now the city is being restored by volunteers, by donations, and by some cash, you know, from the European Union, some cash from the European Union and from the central government. And in that city, a person approaches and I, I left the group, you know, because, you know, with all these American experts, you know, they would better see themselves, you know, because I understood everything, and I, I, and I wanted some privacy to think of what I, what I discovered. And, uh, and the person approaches me and says, you look like not from this place, so what are you doing here? By, by his outlook, you know, obviously he was a construction worker. And it happened that that person, Sergei, Russian, uh, from Gornopodolsk, which is in the west of Ukraine, in the Carpathian Mountains, very similar to, 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 to Lviv, sort of uh, Austrian old town and that sort of stuff, nice, no damages because of the war, because it's small, nobody is interested to, 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 to destroy it. So that person, after sending his family to Germany because of the war, came to work as a volunteer, a Russian, and he explained that his entire family, his mother, his father, his sister-in-law, uh, his cousins, and that's, all of them were uh, uh, military people in the Soviet army, and not only the Soviet army. So, and he said, I don't like orders, but I can work, and that's why I'm here. So, this is another evidence that, you know, the, the, the will to overcome this uh, situation, and I will finish here, no, probably two, two more points, uh, to overcome this situation is there, and it's very strong. What does it mean to overcome the situation? Number one, I, yes, I have two points, or two sub-themes. One is what needs to be done, and number two, whether Ukraine is ready or not. 
So, number one, it means that this will I mentioned should be reinforced. It, sh it can be in reinforced in a very simple manner. Number one, it is sanctions. I can tell you the story about sanctions because I was covering this, you know, for different, uh, uh, for different agencies, including the Foreign Policy uh, Center in London. Uh, number two, step up the military support. Number three, step up the economic support. Currently, Ukraine receives about 12 billion uh, euro a month of international support. Military, non-military, economic balance of payment support, and humanitarian. So it should be increased to probably 15 billion a month. Number four, what should be done? The military support should be reorganized. It should be reinforced. In order to be reinforced, it should be made simpler, which basically means that a committee takes decision what to supply, not individual countries. Because when you have individual countries, it takes ages you know, for delivered 10 tanks, you know, they had a debate in the Bundestag, you know, for about three months. So what NATO can do and must do is streamline the decision making. Number five, it should be clearly stated what has been recognized as a reality. And the clearly state, clear statement by an international community would have been that it is not about Ukraine. This is about international order. This is about Georgia. This is about Moldova. This is about Europe. Number six, this may be stated in only one manner. And this is excluding Russia from the Security Council of the United States, of the United Nations. It cannot be done because it requires anonymous decision of the Security Council. But it can be done by dismantling the veto power of the members of the Security Council. Actually, this very document, draft document, has been submitted today by Gautierrez to the, to the General Assembly of the United Nations. So, last point. Is Ukraine ready? Yes and no. Yes, because of the fact I've mentioned with this colonel. No, because they don't understand the basics of what happened in Georgia. Uh, and what happened in Georgia is that you created prosperity through competition. They want to have Uh, the assessment by IMF, the World Bank, is they want to have a Marshall Plan or recovery or reconstruction program of uh, 420 billion dollars. And this is a preliminary assessment. This is the assessment which is based on data of last year. So, on the top of that, there will be about 160, about 180 billion dollars uh, uh, government debt, which shall be restructured and probably, as an example, probably is the war in Iraq, which basically means that 80% of that debt will be cancelled. Which means that Ukraine will receive close to $600 billion international program. Why they are not ready? They are not ready because they don't understand that prosperity is created by freedom and competition. And because they don't understand this, they believe that this 600 billion will be aid, will be grants, will be used as uh, 
as a tool to support competitive industries of Ukraine. Uh, most of the projects should be fulfilled by Ukrainian uh, uh, entities, be these firms, companies, people, and that sort of stuff, which is totally nonsensical. Because when you have grants, so you have people who start queuing for grants. In economics, it's called crowding out effect. Every granting opportunity, every subsidization opportunity basically creates a queue for the subsidy or the grant, which basically prevents the economic activity. You have a similar effect as the lockdown with the pandemic, but you have it by a good will, you know, because there is a grant. Actually, what they have at the moment, is in not everyone, no, not the colonel, but some of the politicians in, uh, in Kiev, they have in mind that they will be uh, uh, enjoying, you know, a debt relief, as I said, 80%, which is very likely. And there are people working on this. Now, there are some Bulgarians at the IMF, and we are basically lobbying for that. Uh, uh, and also, of those 400-something billion of today's estimate, about 80% will be grants. This has not happened ever. Uh, it coincides with the tradition of the European Union since 2019, the so-called Green Deal and the recovery plan. So it's about 60%, no, less than 16, but huge amount of grants. So, but if you take uh, after war reconstruction, then you should go to the Marshall Plan available to the European countries after the World War II. And what was the segment of grants there was about 15%, not 60, not 50, not 20. It was about 15%. And most of the grants were not used by any of the countries which enjoyed some support uh, from, uh, uh, from the Marshall Plan. The only country which used grants at the level of, uh, of say, 20, 25% of the funds received through the Marshall Plan was France. And what they did, you know, they first, you know, financed Renault, then, then financed Peugeot, then the nuclear power station, then uh, the trains, and eventually the France recovered much slower than, than, than Germany, which did not use any of the grants. Because they simply believe that it's better to work than, 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 than being paid for not working. Uh, I think, this is last sentence, I think that this constellation in Ukraine uh, will be changed. Uh, Ukraine will come to, back to the basics. Uh, Kaha, in his last interview uh, with, uh, uh, with Dmitry Gordon, especially mentioned this, that these Ukrainians, they hope for grants. This is wrong. It would never be done. So probably they will realize, you know, what Kaha said. Thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, thanks for your speech, first of all. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so as I understand, this war is not actually about the country of Ukraine, uh, but uh, about the world politics and economy in general, mostly. So, uh, and Ukraine getting lots and lots of grants from the US as well as from Europe. Uh, so do you think it will make the corruption worse and worse? Because we are talking about lots of grants, so I think it's just human nature that everybody tries to benefit from it personally. Uh, and so, and second question uh, kind of related is, uh, do you think that, uh, why does you, uh, Europe not let Ukraine be its part? Second question is very complicated. Uh, uh, yes, the, the answer to the first question is yes. Down the road, not now, uh, granting so much things to Ukraine is dangerous. Uh, 
there are lots of economic explanation to that. At the moment, it is not dangerous. Why? Because it's a war. One of the impressions, I mean, you travel to Kiev, you know, via Warsaw, and then you take a train, then you take a bus, and that sort of stuff, it's crazy. So, but one of the things you see in the country is that there is so much to be destroyed. And there is so much to be prevented of being destroyed that people take rational decisions. It's absolutely obvious. It's everywhere. Um, the second question. Uh, hmm. uh, uh, can I go on with yeah, one? Yeah, sure. Uh, is, um, so I think because United States and Europe are throwing lots and lots of grants, but are not really, uh, I think they are really thinking about themselves and not the country of Ukraine. So their uh, uh, position to Russia and the world politics and economy. So, uh, yeah, I want to give you this perspective and to get... Uh, an no, no, I mean, uh, you say a lot. What does a lot mean, you know? Yeah, you just said uh, 400 or something. Uh, but that's billions. peanuts. Hmm. I mean, the, the, the grants, Ukraine receives, I mean, military grants, you know, donations and this. Uh, uh, not everything is donation, of course. Uh, are 0.03% of US GDP. Less than 0.03. So what they receive from the European Union is 0.36%. So that's a bit more than, than Europe in terms of uh, uh, percentage of GDP, but the European GDP is smaller than, than the United States, so it's basically equally. So, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is not, how to say, this is not an economic challenge for, uh, for the Europeans. This is part of the problem. They might be, because the amounts are relatively small, they might be uh, not so vigilant on how it is spent. But at the same time, you know, there are rules of spending which are sufficiently effective at the moment, and they prevent at the moment, you know, any sort of uh, grant corruption. So, but if you have, say, 50% of 400 billion, so this is the 100% of the economy. So, I mean, this is obviously, you know, a, 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 a recipe for disaster. So the second thing, uh, Europe. Uh, Europe is not a perfect place, uh, p putting it mildly. <laughs> Uh, why? Uh, what we see at the moment, with, I mean, if you follow the press, uh, if you follow the international media, you know, the countries of the European Union, including my own country, which consider uh, 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 issuing a ban on imports from, uh, from Ukraine, which is illegal act, you know, in terms of the, the bylaws in terms of the Constitution of the European Union. The Constitution of the European Union is very simple. So, I mean, it's lots of pages, but it's simple. So, because it has one simple principle. And this simple principle is that economy is international, politics is national. So, in fact, the European Union is, is saving the nation state. There is a special book about this, by the way, very good book. So, why the European Union is saving the nation state? Because things which are typically political, like taxes, social welfare, and law. Today, there are not very good events about uh, rule of law in, uh, in, in Georgia, but what you can do. And today, I mean today. Uh, there was no sufficient parliamentary a Georgian dream actually w walked out, you know, not to have the sufficient majority, a quorum in the parliament. Uh, so, and when you internationalize economic life, 
we will basically create competition. But when you start regulating economic behavior, when you start providing subsidies, you are in fact destroying competition. And what is the negative sentiment now towards the import from Ukraine is a very dangerous precedent. Because uh, with uh, regulating different sectors you, and subsidizing different sectors, you create wrong expectations that everybody should be saved by the international community, by the budget of, of the European Union, which basically means by the budget uh, <laughs> uh, collected you know, from the member states, so, or by the Germans, for example. So, and this is, this is something which is, uh, 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 which is dangerous in terms of liberalization and competition after the war. I forgot to mention that one of the prerequisites, you know, for, 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 for the success of these six points is that the war ends in terms wished by Ukraine, not by anybody else. So it's impossible. There will be no end of the war. So if there is somebody else's desire fulfilled. So, and if everything uh, ends, you know, in this manner, then the issue is subsidies to Ukraine. Will subsidies to Ukraine create the same hostility in the European Union? I am absolutely sure that it will. So the only way for the European Union to reconstruct Ukraine is to skip subsidies. I'm not sure, but it's a clear logic in my point of view. Thanks. Yeah, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, thank you for the lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, you said that uh, after the Crimea, uh, back in uh, 2014, uh, the sanction did not really bite. Uh, can you give us a glimpse, like, are they really biting now? They didn't buy it because of uh, the, 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 the bans on military exports and some other things. Uh, the, the regulation of the European Union, it was taken on 14th of April, like three weeks after the annexation of Crimea, uh, uh, 2014. Um, and if you read there, you know, these are, you know, different companies, different individuals, like uh, 60 individuals, for banks and, uh, and uh, on some of the transactions. I can explain why the bans on transactions with the banks did not work, if somebody is interested, because it's a very technical issue. Uh, so and what is going on now? Uh, like, uh, really my question is, uh, we don't see like Russian economic co collapses. This uh, was like, what was advertised at the beginning of the war that, oh, now we are heavily sanctioning Russia and its economy will collapse. Like, will we be seeing it anytime no, no, soon no, or no, not? No, 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 that's not, that, that's not the case. The Russian economy is not collapsing. So that's for sure. Because it cannot collapse in such a short time. Okay. No, that, that's obvious, you know. Uh, there were predictions, uh, for example, uh, that Polish colleague of mine, he believed that the Russian economy will uh, contract about 11%, uh, which is not the case. The contraction is about three, perhaps, for the last year. Not final data, but, you know, 3% is basically peanuts. Why? Because there were reserves. Yeah. What will be the situation now when the reserves are going down, be this monetary reserves or reserves of supplies and that sort of stuff, uh, is, is an absolutely different story. Uh, so, uh, most of the people today think that uh, uh, the, the sanctions will bite later, perhaps towards the end of this year. 
and uh, they will have an impact on everything related to technology and this explains why uh, uh, Russia is uh, uh, is trying to keep uh, uh, close relations with China because non-embargoed supplies from China may be a channel of supplying the army. So in that sense, uh, the enlargement of the sanctions uh, is very important, which basically means for the for the time being, it, it, it is used as, as a threat. So, for example, when President Xi says something, you know, President Biden says, you know, you watch, <laughs> watch your steps because we will impose sanctions on you. China does not have an interest, but uh, nobody knows whether they have the brains to understand that. Uh, because uh, uh, China share in the trade uh, with Russia is about 10% of the global China trade. So they will not be able to lose 90% you know, of, uh, of, of, of their foreign income, of, of exports, for example, you know, because of 10%. So they won't opt for a full open supply of, uh, uh, of Russia, especially with military and embargo products. Another thing which is important is that <clears throat> you have sanctions, but you cannot impose them from one day on another because you have contracts. So, for example, you know, there are lots of Russian nuclear reactors you know, in Europe. Uh, for example, there were three Lukoil uh, refineries in Europe. Uh, there was uh, a supply of crude oil you know, to those refineries. So, and if you, if, you ex if you impose sanctions, or if you can impose sanctions immediately from one day to another, then you violate the international <coughs> or normal trade law. You pay uh, penalties for that, so it's too costly. And then there is a second cost, which is because of the interrupted supplies. So, you can't do that. So. Uh, another thing which is important is that sanctions work like, and these sanctions, uh, this is very visible, they work in concentrated circles. You know, the, the, the first immediate circle is, uh, for example, you know, banks, you know, individuals, government operations, military operations, and that sort of stuff. And then those who operate in Russia, be these beer producers like Heineken, or automakers like uh, Renault, yeah. you know, they realize that trading with Russia creates a bad image and people won't buy Heineken. So you basically calculate the loss, which is 400 million euro, by the way, so, and you pull out of the country and you sell, you know, for one ruble, you know, what you have in the country. The same was the case with Ikea and that sort of stuff. So it's, the, this calculation takes time. So you should realize, you know, how, how it is to be done. You should realize, you know, what you can do, what you can take as an asset, you know, from your breweries, for example, or IKEA uh, factories or McDonald's shops and that sort of stuff. Eventually they calculated they cannot take much of that. Uh, but it takes time. And the next thing which takes time is the pull out of Renault. So as far as I remember, Renault investment in Russia is about 2.9 billion. Uh, and when they decided to pull out, it took them perhaps 12 months to decide. So you not only use the original investment, but you should be prepared to service the contracts of everybody who bought Renault in Russia. So which is a 30-year contract. So you cannot just you know, pull out because you would wish to pull out. Plus, there were mistakes, you know, which explained. You know, one of the key mistakes, uh, this is a technical point, but I believe it's very important. <coughs> On the first month uh, in April, uh, after the war, from 1st of April, there were uh, sanctions on the so-called international payments via the SWIFT system. So it happened that it, not, it was not working until July. Why? 
because the very system, the software of the system, did not have a requirement to point the source of money. So when it was done by fax on paper and that sort of stuff, or the old software of the SWIFT system, you know, it had a line on uh, the origination of money. But because SWIFT system is part of the European system and because the European pay payment system should be faster, you know, this line was deleted from the software. And people needed, you know, about three months to realize that <laughs> the sanctions on, on bank transfers did not work. And in the meantime, you know, uh, Russia managed to collect about 5 billion euro. So, just because of this simple fact. And last but not least, uh, 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 with, uh, with, with sanctions, you should design sanctions in a manner which does not hurt your financial position or your assets. So, which basically means that you should design sanctions in a manner that will allow international portfolio investors to collect their money from Russia. And it is very difficult. So, for this reason, you know, it, it is not fully applied at the moment because of the simple reason that about 128 billion in terms of what has been calculated uh, uh, last year, 128 billion dollars, you know, shall not be collected by uh, by investors, which is which is a problem. You create a havoc on the Wall Street, for example. So, I have a question. Yes, sure. First of all, thank you very much for coming. It was a very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that you mentioned China. I'm uh, major in uh, Chinese, international relations. And uh, uh, we all know who supports Ukraine, the, the Western countries uh, for most part. And uh, we know who supports Russia openly, who supports uh, Russia okay, on, yeah. on the ground, uh, cannot That's be known. Yeah. But uh, we do know one uh, very crucial and cold hard fact. Uh, the rest of the world, uh, talking about Asia, Africa and the Latin American countries, uh, have uh, a history of uh, colonialism and uh, they have, uh, should I say, vilified uh, uh, the Western powers quite a bit. So. Um, uh, they have most of the resources, both human as well as material. And uh, wouldn't you think that because of that, uh, the odds do not seem to favor the Ukrainians? No. no there, there is such an element in, uh, in India, uh, this colonial past. Uh, in India, uh, even before President Modi, uh, there was uh, 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 academic, to an extent, or intellectual effort, you know, to uh, to consider different economic hist historic economic scenarios if uh, India would not become a colony of uh, of, 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 of Britain. Uh, and because of this, whatever uh, uh, intellectual movement, uh, historic recognition, uh, self-esteem, and that sort of stuff of uh, recent India, you know, the, 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 the stance towards the war is, uh, let's keep neutral. I mean, all these, you know, uh, Western powers, they have been colonialists and that sort of stuff. This is very strong in India, uh, but it is eroding there. Uh, uh, so, with uh, the efforts of uh, of, um, of other intellectuals, I Indian uh, intellectual climate is uh, is absolutely free, and uh, there is a strong debate already six months on the major Indian me media uh, of two groups of opinion makers. One is basically. Uh, 
wait and see. Uh, let's buy some cheap oil, crude oil from Russia, uh, I mean, which is basically a normal uh, attitude. And the opposite, which basically explains what I am explaining. Uh, today, in the afternoon, 3 o'clock, uh, 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 Kiev time, uh, I have arranged uh, an interview by a friend of mine. I would have considered him Ukrainian Krasan Stanchev, Vladimir Dubrovsky, to appear on one of the major political talk shows uh, on the Indian national TV, explaining the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, point of view. And in the European countries, you have much more dangerous attitudes than in Asia. And this is, uh, of course, uh, Prime Minister Orban and his party, which has a uh, uh, full majority in the parliament. And the next person uh, with a very bad behavior is President Radev of Bulgaria. So we are working on his impeachment. But this is our work. And this is Chinese work. I mean, so. If the Chinese want something normal for their country, they should stand against you know, the, 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 the secret dealings of uh, President Xi with Putin. So what, what's important here is that individual efforts matter. It's absolutely important. So we were discussing these very long evenings with, uh, with Kaha, you know, the so-called <coughs> free riding behavior. In any public action, you have a free riding. So you basically expect that somebody else should finish the job and you basically collect the benefits. So this free riding problem is very difficult to, to, to resolve, including in this situation, including in situation of war. On one thing, you know, uh, on one case, uh, for example, in Ukraine, uh, corporate taxes has become totally voluntary. So when everybody pays corporate taxes. So virtually all the taxes except you know VAT have become voluntary and people pay that. So but in more complicated actions, you know, not just uh, paying taxes, you know, people are very often opportunistic. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Yeah, you were in Kyiv two weeks ago, and I'm interested about your opinion. What are the chances for this tax reform in Ukraine? First question, and second, maybe about the past. Why these Western companies decided, why they rushed into Russia and China as well? Because if you look in the Economic Freedom Index, of Russia or China or any other indices about uh, human freedom or anything. The, the Russia is very complicated place for uh, investment because there is no court, there is no media, there is nothing there you can rely as, a, as an entrepreneur that you sell something and they don't pay, what can you do other, other than to go to the criminals and ask them to help but uh, they went there and they started lots of businesses. When last time I was writing about this, it was like uh, more than 100 international companies. They sell their goods uh, to, in Georgia, but produced in Russia. And I was interested why they are doing this, why they are producing goods in Russia, which is not the best place for investment best place for, for business. But when you talk about this, uh, sometimes you recall the similar situation in Ukraine as well. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so the first question, they're not ready with, uh, with clear concept of what they do with uh, the public finances during the war. Uh, for the time being, they, they, they do day-to-day management of different uh, uh, donations and support from the international community. And I don't think they can do anything uh, on this front, on day-to-day -day, uh, uh, management of the public finances. As to the uh, 
to 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 what they see as a, as a reconstruction success for the time being the 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 prevailing opinion is uh, that you support like france you know different whatever competitive industries which is which is not good but at the same time there are lots of people like that colonel and many others you know, in government and uh, in the Ministry of Finance and in Verkhovna Rada uh, and in universities uh, who are of uh, the right opinion. They would like to have competition and then a uh, simple system. Uh, the, the drafts are there. It's some sort of a combination between Georgian tax reform and Estonian tax reform. But these are the drafts. So at the moment, I cannot have even an opinion on how successful the group which supports and drafts all this will be successful, because I don't know how the political system will be working there. So you need doers like uh, Vato you know, to, to make the things happen. So uh, the second question. I think the, the basic answer of uh, uh, of the entire story of foreign investment uh, in China and Russia is very simple, and this is opportunism. So you see all these deficiencies in the system, in the law, you see uh, 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 rates, you see expropriations, you know, there, there were huge expropriations, you know, for example, Shell on Sakhalin, British Petroleum, you name it. <clears throat> and at the same time, you know, on other areas of business, other sectors, you know, people tend to think that if I'm not going there, you know, somebody else will go there and I will lose my global advantage. So that's why people go to China and, uh, and Russia. And it's a logical behavior. I mean, so this is not because they don't pay attention to, to indices. They know the indices, but if you don't go there, you know, then your competition will go there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, life is not perfect, you know, so, so, <laughs> so that's why they go. All the gains they can have from this, then they have costs. <coughs> they, they have costs. They used to have costs, and they have even higher costs now. So, obviously. Uh, but at the same time, you sh I mean, you've mentioned at the end uh, Ukraine. Uh, in 2005, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Anders Asland, one of the whatever, relatively popular uh, uh, experts on uh, the ex-Soviet countries, uh, had a very interesting article. You can Googleize it and you will find it on the page of the Institute uh, case in Warsaw. Uh, the title of the article is uh, Comparative Oligarchy, Russia, Ukraine and the United States. Uh, Anders is very, I mean, he has another book, you know, The Corruption in Russia, which is uh, recently published and it's available. Uh, so uh, he understands very well Russia, he understands very well Ukraine, he is a complete disaster on the United States. He doesn't understand the United States. Uh, but what he makes, and this is obvious, you know, by all the developments after 2005, what he makes as a key point about the oligarchy in, uh, uh, in Ukraine is the following. Those folks are open. Nobody is hiding their decisions their revenue, their personal wealth. So those who hide something are in power. Be this Timoshenko, Yanukovych, you name it. So these are the politicians who hide, which is a normal thing, I think, because politicians have a sense of guilt. So if you do something, you know, which is uh, basically required and people are ready to pay for, so that's fine. So which is not the Russian case. So the Russian case is that you have a cap, capo di tutti capi, and this is the president. So he's the head of the oligarch. 
So there is a good paper, since you are students, which is called From Soviets to Oligarchs. Very good one. Uh, published by the National Bureau of Economic Research two years ago. No, two years ago. So, so the, the, the Ukrainian oligarchy, you know, is, is very, very transparent. One of the oligarchs was even a president, Petro Poroshenko. Mm -hmm. I never met a more decent businessman than Poroshenko, just by chance. He wanted to buy something before becoming president in Bulgaria. And I was doing, with colleagues, we were doing the due diligence of, uh, of the thing he wanted to buy. I had one point, but I really would like to suggest some explanation to Gia's question and maybe you confirm or deny. Why do investments rush to R Russia and China? I think this is a different thing. Firstly, uh, second is that uh, when they started investing, Russia was quite a different country in the beginning of the 21st century. And third, big companies are inclined, and it's obvious, to chronic capitalism. If you offer an easy access to the market, without competition. So it's again opportunistic, why not to take? This was explained to me by one Polish businessman who, whom I tried to convince to come to Georgia. And he was very open and honest to tell me, you know, I better go to Belarusia because in Georgia I have to compete it's open market, there is a lot of import and so on. Of I go to Belarus, they have very disciplined corruption, which she pointed out as an advantage, very disciplined. You pay somebody and you work. You have your share of the pie and of course, I mean, not predicting that some disasters happen, this is what lures the investments to those countries, I think. I would like to hear your point, too, on, on that explanation. And second is just very speculative. So as a person who knows the situation, maybe, I don't know, a little bit inside of the EU, a little bit uh, in Ukraine. So the world changes, so Ukraine changes, the EU changes, I think, yeah. Uh, and if not, please correct me, the NATO changes. It, it will take time before it, the change bill will become obvious and then efficient, so like sanctions. And Russia changes too, to the worse, hopefully. So will Ukraine stand this time? So is the resources enough? At some moment in time, I believe that Sanctions will work, I don't know, you will become, I don't know, more flexible, NATO will be, I don't know, decision making will be more straightforward, but is that time given to Ukraine to get to this, maybe, I don't know, moment of truth when everything works? That's one comment and one question. Quite yeah. speculative, I believe. Yeah. I believe it's billion. Dollar question, I, but I, I completely buy the point uh, of uh, your counterpart, you know, from Poland. I mean, it's less costly to operate in an environment where the corruption is centralized than in an environment in which everybody takes bribes independently from everybody else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, at the same time, you know, when everybody takes bribes independently from others, the bribes do not tend to be very high. So, uh, so, and you, if you ideally have three options, you know, a non-corrupt environment, then you have a cost of competition and, of course, risk. So, in a centralized corruption environment, you have, uh, uh, you have less cost but uh, high, higher risks you know, because you might be replaced by somebody else, you know, if President Putin wishes. 
uh, and in, the co in an environment of uh, everybody taking bribes independently, uh, you basically have a safe environment. Because, you know, because of the competition between the corrupted officials, you know, they keep the prices low, and because they cannot assure... <laughs> and because they cannot assure an outcome of what you are proposing as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an outcome, so they do not ask for, for, for a lot. So, and this is, uh, this is a, a normal, whatever, choice between three scenarios. And the second was uh, uh, Ukraine. Hmm. Uh, Ukraine is changing for the better. So, I mean, uh, this is shown by the war. There are lots of things which worry you when you visit. Some of those uh, things I've mentioned. But if you take uh, uh, indices, so Ukraine uh, improved a lot in the uh, uh, indices of democracy. In Ukraine improved a lot in the transparency international indices. It's not the best, but it improved a lot. It's not Georgia. Uh, it improved a lot in terms of, uh, uh, of rule of law. So it is three times better than Russia at the moment, although they were worse uh, compared to Russia in Yanukovych's time. So if you look... so. Uh, and one thing is very important for Ukraine, and this is the well-being of people. If you take uh, the, uh, uh, the global wealth report uh, for the last 20-something years, so currently the fastest growing wealth, for those who are economists, you know, I must explain that, uh, wealth is not GDP. This is the value of all the assets owned by individuals of a country which are above 18 years of age or above the uh, uh, age when they can own something. So in some countries it will be 21, in some countries it will be less and that sort of stuff. So in the last 10 years, so which basically means uh, uh, after Crimea. So Ukraine is one of the fastest growing countries in terms of people's wealth. So, and they, I mean, part of the, I mean, economics is not about, e economy is not everything in life, you know, it's a very minor segment of life. The, 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 the life meaning of econ e economy is that it put limits to, to, to your desires, you know, to, to your utopia, to your ideas and that sort of stuff. So, so and uh, 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 what happened actually in uh, 2014 is that, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainians, this was my starting point, Ukrainians lost lots of utopias, you know. For example, the, the utopia that Russia will be there, you know, supplying, you know, cheap energy or free, you know, uh, you know it's, 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 it's vanished. Of course, there are lots of uh, things which uh, uh, one should blame on uh, the so-called international community. In 2018, 2019, I was evaluating the international economic programs for Ukraine uh, for the State Department of the United States. And I was shocked that uh, first, you know, the only country which manages, you know, uh, grants and credits to Ukraine well, with lots of uh, good impacts afterwards, is Japan. So none of the others, you know, was doing well. Uh, another thing which I realized is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulatory things which were a good example in uh, Georgia, uh, Ukrainians, they did not uh, deal with, good, with, with, with important things. They were very good at small things, you know. For example, uh, I mean, a medical example will be, you know, you 
uh, I'm a doctor and you are curing my left ear, you know, but you might, might have a problem with the nose, you know, so. Uh, so they were very good on this, you know, they, they, were, they were losing the forest, you know, behind the trees. Uh, which is not the case already. They, they, are, they are more focused on important things, and this is because of the war. And there are lots of other uh, similar issues, uh, which, in my point of view, lead to the conclusion that uh, Ukraine is not uh, oh, realign, being realigned for the worse. It's being realigned for the better, and perhaps, you know, the war is something of the sort, you know, for, for Europe and the Northern Hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a Russian saying, if I may tell it in English, so explaining to others you understand yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.